Well, hello everybody and welcome to the 1619 Project. Uh, this is a 1619 uh, discussion about race in the country and the impact that uh, slavery has had on our on everything that we do. We have special guest today, Brian Beery, who is well known to our 1619 uh, group, is going to do the presentation. A special guest is Marcus Renner, who is the chair of the uh, Arroyo Seco Placekeepers Board. And so we're going to be talking about Arroyo Seco, which is a significant geological feature in this area. And we're going to talk about the, the development past and future. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian and Marcus. Brian and Marcus, uh, take it away. It's all yours. Thank you very much, Dave or Dick. And thank you for um, inviting us back to the 1619 Project. It's uh, exciting to be here again. Um, what I wanted to start off with today uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, my colleague Marcus Renner for being a part of this discussion, and you'll learn a little bit more about him and about his research, as well as um, the project he's been working on the last couple of years. Um, what I wanted to do to start off with, because um, this is the Pasadena Village, I wanted to ask you a few questions uh, just to do some level setting. Uh, about the Arroyo Seco. So the first one is when you hear uh, the phrase, the Arroyo Seco, what images come to your mind? And you can place them in the chat or you can uh, raise your hand or just uh, express yourself. So what what image comes to your mind when you hear the Arroyo Seco? The Rose Bowl. Rose Bowl, good. What else? A long, beautiful park. Long, beautiful park. How about some of the rest of you? I think it was a, a wealthy area, uh, the West Patton area, and very, very smoggy. So affluent and then also uh, contaminated air. Right. What, what other images come to your mind when you hear uh, the Arroyo Seco being mentioned or described? Um, what it used to be? A long mm -hmm. time ago, and it's sort of my front yard. I live at the corner of Mission and Arroyo Drive, so I see it all the time from my windows. So I feel like it's a, a, a part of where I live, and I love it. I think of um, the artist community that was there and the people who were kind of not traditional thinkers who kind of origin well i don't know if it was originally but at one point they kind of constellated there yeah and we will actually mention that uh we'll describe that a little bit uh sharon so thank you for uh, bringing that to our our minds uh Next question, and you're you're welcome to answer that first one as well. But the next question is, um, uh, what is your experience in the Royal Seco? Judith uh, has already kind of kicked that off, saying it's right in her front yard. But what is what is your experience with the Royal Seco? Uh, I'm not able to walk a lot now, but on Sundays. Um, Years ago, I would go from my home up to the Rose Bowl and back on Sunday. On Saturday, I would go halfway. I'd go to California Street and Sunday to the um, to the bridge. And when I got to the bridge, I always, no matter how tired I was, I had to touch the bridge with my hand. And then I'd head back. Um, I have to say also during COVID, I was totally isolated and I still am somewhat. And I think being on the Arroyo and have been co feeling connected to it uh, saved what sanity I might have left. Um, it's just, it's very nurturing to me in many, many ways. And especially I couldn't go out my front door and no one could come in. So um, it was really important to me. I think if I had been in a house without windows overlooking the Arroyo, floor to ceiling windows, I, I don't think I'd be on this call right now. 
Thank you very much, Judith, for sharing that. You actually answered several of the other questions that we wanted to pose as well. And so what's your experience with the Oroseco? Uh, why is it important to you? And why is it important to the community? So everything from the connection to the outdoors and the reduction of isolation, those are really, really key points. Uh, so I'd, I'd love to hear from uh, a few other people. What is your connection to the Arroyo Seco? Well, I'll speak again, and that is that I hiked down there, and it's a, it's just a, it, it's almost as good as hiking in the, uh, in the Arroyo, in the hills behind us, but not, <laughs> but pretty nice place to hike up and down. Great. Other thoughts? Yeah, I was saying the same thing that we walked a lot with our children and our dog and we took the children to the casting pond and they had fun time looking at the tadpoles. Uh, just a lot of really good memories of that area. Wonderful. Thank you, Nancy. The what Marcus will be sharing with us is a bit of uh, history of the Arroyo Seco, which uh, some of you may or may not be aware of. Uh, before we do that, and it and it goes into the casting pond or the the archery or the the golf mm -hmm. course, the Rose Bowl, all of those landmarks. Uh, before we do that, are there some of you? Uh, are there any of you who have either very little or no experience with the Arroyo Seco? I have none. So Dick and Melba, for sure. Very little. I have very little actual experience down in. Most of my experience is looking down in, as opposed to being down in. That's actually kind of a, a key observation, uh, Sharon, because um, I think for many people in Pasadena, that is their experience. They, mm -hmm. for some reason, they don't feel either they're welcome or or even for some people, maybe that it's not safe. And so we're gonna uh, dive into some of those questions as well. Dick, I saw you raised your hand. Did, did you wanna share what your experience with the Arroyo is? Well, all I was gonna say is I'm, I'm new to Pasadena and I can't drive, can't see and can't walk. So that takes away a lot of my appreciation of Arroyo Seco. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of limited there. So I don't really have much that, to contribute to that. Well, I hope at some point in time you're able to go down and experience it uh, in some way um, because it is a, a beautiful space and it's a very unique space. Uh, there are very few cities. If you, if you think about um, the cities around us uh, in Los Angeles, there are very few cities that have this type of vast extended open space that, um, that starts up in the foothills and continues all the way down to the border with South Pasadena. Uninter uninterrupted pretty much except for the freeways so well, I'll, I'll see if i can arrange to get somebody to drive me over there and drive me around and tell me what i could see if i could see <laughs> let's do yeah. it there we ask, go <laughs> ask donine donine will yeah. take you over there okay donine's a good one okay all right that's a good yeah. tip <sighs> okay so now kind of shifting gears what we're going to do is we're going to um talk to you a little bit about the, the history of the Arroyo Seco. And some of that history is layered into what the 1619 project is focused on. So that's uh, equity, that's uh, racial justice, uh, and that's um, access. So um, Marcus, are you, you ready to um, share a few images with us and talk a little bit about that history? Yeah, before, before I do this, I just want to introduce myself. And my name is Marcus Renner. And um, I grew up in Pasadena and uh, in East Pasadena. And so uh, ended up uh, going to school, uh, junior high school overlooking the Arroyo. But, but that uh, similar to what Brian was saying, that, that trip over to West Pasadena, West Pasadena was a little bit of a different world for me entering as a 13 year old and <laughs> trying to make sense of, of what you know, those neighborhoods uh, were, were about and how it related to my family. And, um, and so just a, a brief introduction of kind of where what I'm going to share is coming from. Uh, I'm, I'm doing a dissertation for UC Davis um, on geography. 
And, um, and so this research and the Aurora Cycle Placekeepers Project, which uh, we started a pilot, um, and which I'll talk about in a little bit, is, is kind of the subject of my dissertation. And so a lot of the research that I've been doing uh, about the history of the Arroyo and how, like each of you who shared, you shared, you know, particular experience, you have particular stories and associations. And, and I went into this research with the recognition that, that um, there are a lot of different experiences and some, we need to pay attention to those experiences that are common, um, but we also need to pay experiences that are very different. Um, and, um, and that by paying attention to the stories that people have around the Arroyo is, can open up new, um, new ways to look at the issues that surround the Arroyo and that trying to create a sense of belonging to this space, a sense of connection is really important to preserving it, to improving it, um, and to addressing a lot of the different issues. And one of the issues um, because of the history um, of the Arroyo that's important is equity. And so one of the main questions that came to me in, in the course of this research is how could the Arroyo be an engine of equity uh, for Pasadena? How can we use the space to generate equity for the entire city? And so that's, that's kind of the, the genesis of, of this presentation. Um, so I'm going to uh, get share my screen and I'm gonna start a slideshow here. just hide these meeting controls. Um, can everybody see, is that a, good, I see some nodding, okay. Yes, we're um, seeing your bridge. Okay, great, yeah, so that's the, that's the, um, the Colorado uh, Street Bridge, which was built in 1913. And as uh, someone was mentioning, kind of the artists, so past, uh, the, the Arroyo was really, um, people, the, the California plain air painters um, were, were an artistic force in Southern California and the Arroyo was kind of their headquarters. They really loved kind of standing out and painting the Arroyo. So some of the images in this presentation come from, come from those painters and 100 years ago, 120 years ago. Um, so um, I, I just actually want to ask, is this a meeting, is that a little better? I, I'm not sure. I've seen your face, some of your faces, but I wasn't sure if that was blocking what you see. Is that all right for everybody? What I'm doing right now? Yeah, we're seeing your pink. Okay. Pink picture. Yeah. yeah. Very important. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, yeah, if you want me to move any of the meeting controls, then just, just let me know. I, I started with this slide because um, I think it's important when we think about this history to practice what I'm calling two-eyed seeing, which is that um, there's a version of, of what I'm going to present that, that's negative, um, that, that's, that's really um, uh, tragic uh, in, in terms of how people have treated each other um, in, in our community. Um, there's another way to look at this, uh, this story of equity in the Arroyo as a place where progress has been made and people, um, people really uh, struggle. And um, because of that struggle and because of working together, they made progress. And I think it's important to, um, to just keep both of those things in view um, as we think about kind of the implications of this for Pasadena. Um, the first thing I wanted to, just to share is that the Arroyo has always been a place that has had um, many cultures um, uh, interacting with it. Um, and this includes the, Gabri it starts with the Gabrielino Tongva villages that were all along, uh, village sites that were all along the Arroyo because of the water uh, and extended into the mission era uh, with Daniel Lalia, uh, who was the first landowner of the ranch of San Pasqual and then passed through several landowners to Manuel Garfias. Um, who built his house on the edge of the Arroyo um, uh, near the border of Pasadena and South Pasadena. Um, Robert Owen uh, was uh, an African-American uh, immigrant from Texas who bought his freedom and then became one of the wealthiest people in Southern California back in the 1850s and 60s. Um, and he uh, built a cabin in Prieto Canyon, which is um, just uh, north of JPL 
and um, and harvested wood from there that um, that he took down into into Los Angeles. So he was a very important figure. This this photo on the left is um, from uh, an area called Indian Flat, and you can see on the right the map is from 1888. This is an irrigation map. And that the area west of the Rose Bowl, between the Rose Bowl and Linda Vista, was known as Indian Flat. And um, it, you know, the the Gabriel and Tongva were uh, were enslaved essentially uh, at the mission, and their communities were um, were devastated. And when during the 1860s, uh, 1850s, 60s, when the the citrus culture was getting going in Pasadena. Those communities, those people who um, they they really had to protect themselves um, from uh, from people who were there was actually bounties in California on native people, and so uh, they made they created rancherias, um, little village settlements um, uh, for for them for kind of mutual protection. From there, they would go out and they would do a lot of the manual labor um, in around Los Angeles and here in the San Gabriel Valley. And there was one here in East Pasadena uh, near the Sunny Slope Waterworks, um, kind of along Huntington Drive and the La Presa Dam area. But there was another one in the Arroyo in this Indian flat area. And this is the only uh, photo that I've been able to find of, of a native person. And it's, it's, it's where the Holly Street Bridge um, joins uh, Linda Vista Avenue. Mm. Um, the final piece of just kind of that early history I wanna mention um, uh, is the Brown family um, that uh, Brent John Brown uh, from Harper's Ferry, uh, his uh, two sons, two of his sons, Jason Owens settled above the Arroyo uh, in Altadena. And then his daughter, uh, Ruth, settled um, in in Pasadena along the Arroyo as well. And, and they were, um, you know, they were really uh, kind of uh, celebrities in a lot of ways because uh, the past, early Pasadena settlers, um, uh, a lot of them had connections to the abolition movement and, um, and they really were seen as, um, as examples um, for a lot of the early uh, people in Pasadena. And and please stop me if I'm if uh, if you have a question. Um, uh, I also uh, uh, also like to start here. Um, Frank Prince, uh, the Prince family was one of the first African American families in Pasadena. Um, Frank Prince, I believe, moved here in 1887 with his brother and his father, um, and uh, he, he was about 16 years old, I believe. And um, he worked. It was his first job was as a coachman for James Scoville, who was uh, um, a, 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 manu a, ma a magnet. Uh, uh, he, had, he had wealth and he moved out here for the winters um, from back east. And he was kind of passing his first philanthropist. He, he built and he owned land right into in the Arroyo. And, um, and so uh, he worked there and he ended up, um, I believe, giving a house to Frank Prince and asking him to, um, to put it nearby because he wanted to live nearby. And so he moved the house, they had to move it to 319 Kensington Place, um, which is near kind of behind where the Pasadena Museum of History is today. And, um, and it's this interesting story in the Prince family history about that they had to move the house and they were only able to move it a little bit at a time. So his son says the horses circled it, stepped over the cable, the house would move forward a few inches and then men would move the contraption. And it took him about two weeks. And this is this is important for me because this area along the Arroyo was um, kind of contested space. So what's what area are we talking about? This this photo is is a photo of Scope, what's known as Scoville Park. Um, where he dammed the Arroyo um, and uh, put a, a bridge across where the Colorado Street Bridge is today. Um, so on the left is a photo from 1898 and on the right is a aerial photo from 1922. And the zigzag path, um, which is in this photo was a walking path from Pasadena down into Scoville Park and into the Arroyo. Um, and you can see kind of where the Frank Prince, uh, where the Prince family home is. And if you were looking at this photo, we'd be looking due east along the 134 freeway, kind of right through the middle of this photo. That's what it looks like today. So 
this area where Frank Prince moved his moved his house and was kind of inching towards kind of being a prominent house along the Arroyo was ended up being right where um, down the street from where the uh, first uh, AME church ended up moving. And um, this symbol of Frank Prince's house kind of being visible and moving slowly into this neighborhood um, was really, I think, uh, a metaphor for the idea of, of African American and other communities of color um, moving into some of these neighborhoods that, that had been um, uh, predominantly white and really caused a reaction. And so in March of 1910, um, as the First AME Church was moving just down the street from that house, they found a can of gasoline with an elaborate fuse um, in underneath the house of the what was going to be the parsonage for the church. And it failed to ignite. Um, but uh, there had been other uh, houses, African American houses that had been burned uh, recently on Cypress Avenue, I believe. Um, there had been many threats. Um, and the Prince brothers ended up guarding uh, essentially the construction site um, uh, with rifles um, uh, during to, to in order to get the, the first AME built on Vernon and Kensington. And then Vernon ended up being, as you might know, the kind of the heart of the uh, African American business community. Um, and then I'm I'm sure you're aware of the um, of the segregation of the Brookside Plunge, uh, starting in 1914, ending in 1947. Um, so uh, there were all I'll say about this is that there were repeated attempts to challenge this through the years by uh, both young and old people, and it affected all people of color um, in terms of using the pool. And it was framed uh, by the city, uh, the city council really as a health issue. And um, that's how they tried to justify um, this, which is, uh, which is really uh, offensive. Um, but another piece of this history that uh, might not be known is, um, is Arroyo Seco Elementary. And um, this was at the corner of uh, uh, South Grand and Bellefontaine. And it was, um, it was a school that was built in 1916, really at the request of white parents in West Pasadena um, who were uncomfortable having their children go to Garfield School, which is where the Orangewood Shopping Mall is across from the hospital. That's where that school was. And it was a diverse school and um, those white parents weren't comfortable. And so they, um, they had this school built. Um, in 1953, that school was overcrowded with white children and there were empty classrooms in Garfield. And so these two pictures, um, 1961, 1963, give you a sense of kind of those populations. But in 1953, um, in order to relieve the crowding, the school district um, uh, commission built kind of added bungalows or trailers to, to house those white children. And um, the NAACP protested saying that um, there are empty classrooms at Garfield. <laughs> this is a waste of taxpayer money. Um, and they threatened a lawsuit. And, um, and that was being watched very carefully by the national office of the NAACP. And there was a lot of conversation about that because that was the time that they were putting together the case for Brown versus the Board of Education. And they were looking for a West Coast uh, district to include within that case. And, and Pasadena narrowly avoided being kind of folded into the, that case. Um, and but it, it presaged the, you know, the, the uh, fights during the 60s about desegregation, desegregating the schools in Pasadena and, and what ended up being the, the 1970 decision that started busing. So, but a lot of people don't know about Arroyo Seco Elementary, um, which was kind of the first um, proving ground for that. So, so those are some, some things that were, were very um, negative um, and tragic. Um, about the history of equity and along the Arroyo. Um, but there also, there's also possible to see the Arroyo as a site of social progress. And so I want to talk just a little bit about baseball because just, um, you know, 100 yards from uh, where the, the plunge is, is the Brookside Field and what's known as Jackie Robinson Field. And, um, and there were, from uh, the early 1900s, there were uh, teams of, of Japanese teams, 
uh, Latino Hispanic teams, African American teams, and there were integrated teams that played down there. And um, one of those teams in the 1930s had Jackie Robinson on him, uh, on it. Uh, the 1939 team uh, won the California Amateur Baseball Championship. And this photo uh, on the right, which shows the in Jackie Robinson is part of the Pasadena infield. Um, they played uh, an exhibition game against the Chicago White Sox that had their um, had their spring training down there. Um, and so there's there was a lot of brouhaha around that that team. Um, but I also want to talk about uh, Nate Moreland because um, Nate Moreland was a little bit older than Jackie Robinson and was served as kind of a mentor for him. So we we often talk about how um, Jackie Robinson was this hero who overcame all these obstacles, and he certainly did. Um, but he had a lot of support within the community of Pastina. And so his victory is really a collective victory of people like Nate Moreland, who went on to be, well, Jackie Robinson was playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. He was playing in semi-pro baseball in California. So he became um, the first uh, person to break the color barrier in uh, on the West Coast uh, for, for baseball. And he was also Pastina, Pastina native. The Rose Bowl is also a, um, a really uh, central to the history of the Arroyo. It was built in 1922 and it quickly became kind of a center of civic activity. Um, it, was, it was so important, um, connection to the Rose Parade that it became a site of a real symbolic power. Um, so much so that in 1924, uh, the, the branch of the Ku Klux Klan requested to use the Rose Bowl uh, for its initiation ceremony and, um, and were refused. So um, that's uh, 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 the, the city manager at the time, Wellington Coiner, um, who was instrumental and was a roadblock in terms of integrating the pool, was one of the persons who, who actually said, no, we're not gonna do that at the Rose Bowl. There have also been, during that early period, a number of um, uh, different cultures that have used the Arroyo, from uh, this orchestra, Mexican Typical orchestra, orchestra in 1928, to uh, Michio Ito, who was a choreographer, a Japanese choreographer, who coordinated this pageant of lights in the Rose Bowl in 1929 and did his famous shadow dance. Um, and had 20,000 people in, in the Rose Bowl to, to watch this big dance performance to uh, an all-star uh, uh, organ chor choral concert um, organized by African-American churches across Southern California in 1930, which the, the Pasadena African-American community organized to, to allow the municipal band to keep playing during the heart of the depression. Um, so there, there are these, the, how the Rose Bowl is used um, is a measure of equity for, uh, for Pasadena. Um, a couple other things. So um, the, the photo on the left is uh, 743 Palisade, which is on the east rim of the Arroyo. And that um, was the subject of a 1944 uh, housing case, Fairchild versus Reigns. And um, uh, an African-American couple moved into that house. And then they were told, no, there's a racial covenant on that house and you can't be there. And they got the white neighbor uh, who sued, got an injunction to force them to move out. Um, but they appealed. They got the help of Lauren Miller, who uh, founded the African-American uh, Los Angeles Sentinel. And he was a lawyer. And they took it all the way to the California Supreme Court and won on a technicality because they were able to show that that, that house they were claiming injury because of the African-Americans who moved in. And the Lauren Miller was able to show that actually there were African-Americans already in the neighborhood, just a few blocks over. And so this is the East Rim is where that color line really started to break down. And so he won the case and said, you can't prove that you've been injured to the white, um, to Miss Fairchild who sued. And because of that case, he got recruited onto the uh, team for the NAACP that argued um, the 1948 case in the federal Supreme Court that got rid of racial covenants and desegregated uh, neighborhoods across the country. 
So 19, 1947, 1948, 1947 was when the uh, Brookside Plunge was, was finally open to everybody. Um, and so this photo is, is from that, that time, from 1947. Marcus, you have a question from Will. Okay. Yeah, sure. If you don't mind, uh, that case, that the Supreme Court, was that the California Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court? Well, the, the Reigns case, um, if I go back, the, uh, for 743 Palisade, that was the California Supreme Court. Okay. And then the 1948 case was the, um, was the federal Supreme Court. And Got it. Okay, so it was the federal. It went all the way. It was a national in, influence right there. Right. Along the, a, a similar question, when we get into these initial first African-American this and that or whatever, I'm curious about what sort of people in the white community or the dominant community supported these actions, uh, what the demographics were, or the kind of people in the major community that stepped up to support them? Well, a lot of, um, and, and Brian, please feel free to, to, to add, um, but one of the ways that the color line broke down along the East Rim was that, um, some uh, uh, some white landowners would would help African Americans purchase their homes and and get loans from the bank, for example, um, and uh, and so that was uh, that was one that was one way to do it. And there were um, there were the forties were. It, there's a there's a Afri there's a thesis that was done by a USC student, which you may know of, um, uh, James Crimmy in 1941, um, which talks about the struggles of the African American community in 1941. There was another thesis that was done by somebody in, at Whittier College in 1947, and um, during that period in 1941, the uh, the YMCA and the YWCA may, were uh, were segregated and um, and blocked a lot of um, a, a lot of activity and, and access to the YWCA and the YMCA. By 1947, some of that had broken down and um, there was, I believe an African-American were, were able to use, um, use some more of the facilities. Um, I believe there was a staff member that was hired um, by 1947. And so it was interesting to just kind of see in those years um, how things were breaking down. Um, Brian, do you wanna talk about Salida Road? Yeah, a couple of points. One is um, going back to the, the abolitionists who were supporting um, Owen Brown. Uh, so Pestina Altadena had a, a strand of what we call today progressive, uh, liberal, open-minded um, individuals who were supportive of integration and supportive of uh, black rights. Obviously, that group was not large, um, but over the years, especially because of advocacy, you know, one of the other uh, strands is the NAACP. I know Will's question was more focused on the white community or the predominant community. Um, and yet, I think that uh, advocacy by the NAACP um, helped the white community or some, some people in the white community to be a little bit more uh, conscious and aware, uh, and and because of these court cases in forty seven and forty eight, uh, caused the white community to uh, reevaluate or gather a little bit more um, momentum. As far as Salida Road, Salida Road. Um, so on the east side of the Arroyo on uh, Arroyo Boulevard, um, right below Washington Boulevard. Uh, that was part of the area that had been set aside or that had been designated uh, to be available to people of color. So um, in, in particular, um, Mexican-American, Japanese-American, African-American families. There, there was a, property, a white property owner on Salida Road who um, assisted several uh, black uh, physicians to purchase land and then be able to um, build their own homes. And they, they, so Salida Road had a nickname uh, called Doctor's Row and um, was, and it's, 
and someone mentioned the Rose Bowl a little while ago, I think it was Dave, and it pretty much overlooks uh, the Rose Bowl. And it's right adjacent to, I think, you know, I had one of our other presentations, I had Chip Williams come on and he talked about his family where in the 1950s, his family was over in Linda Vista and his mother was, and uh, the way Chip describes it is his mother's very white presenting and uh, the realtors would see her and they would uh, show her homes in Linda Vista. And then uh, she would say, well, I'd like to bring my husband back. And he would come back after work in the evening. And they would, 100% uh, 100, 100 of the time, they would say the house is sold. So uh, what they did is they bought a house on a row boulevard right around the corner from Salida Road in 19, I think it was 56 or 57. And he was an architect. So they, they designed and built their own home. And the family still lives there. Um, Chip sisters live in the home, um, so it's it, it's it's a combination of uh, eroding a little bit the racial covenants. Uh, it's uh, advocacy and organizing, and it's it's done both uh, from various perspectives in the community. So hopefully, well, that helps to um, maybe not totally answer your question, but give a little bit more context. Yeah, that does give the context. I'm just saying. Because I think that the uh, without having you went on mute there for a second, I went back on me. Excuse me. The dominant forces for for changing away from segregation, which seemed to have been the norm <laughs> even in the forties and fifties in California, to integration or desegregation, was really led by the people of color, and supported by a subset of people of white people, but not a huge number, but apparently enough to make a difference. And that's sort of a, a lesson for today when we're faced with some sort of retrenchment, that it doesn't take a huge number of people, but it takes persistent people getting their clues and leadership from the people of color. Yeah, I think that's well that's said. And, and it's the notion of allyship uh, and partnership, collaboration, um, uh, recognition, and then uh, uh, taking supportive action. So yes, I think that's well stated, Will. Um, Marcus, back to you. Yeah, I just have, uh, we're, we're gonna stop in a little bit to allow us to talk a little bit more, but that's a great segue into talking about Outward Bound Adventures, um, which was started by uh, Helen Mary Williams um, and her partners who were um, some African-American um, folks who really enjoyed the outdoors. And Helen Mary Williams was an elementary school teacher at Cleveland uh, Elementary School, which is along that East Rim, uh, which is primarily uh, uh, African-American, Japanese-American, um, Hispanic, Latinx um, uh, students. And this is a photo in the upper left of her sixth grade class in 1961. And she uh, she was a science teacher and she took uh, she started a, a junior Audubon science club and started taking students down into the Arroyo and um, and teaching them about the natural world. And they really enjoyed it. And um, then they graduated from Cleveland and they, they went on and they wanted to keep doing it. And so she she found these other uh, folks, uh, African-American folks who had some experience in camping and the outdoors and mountaineering. And they formed this group, Outward Bound Adventures, which um, has maintained since 1962, I think was when it formally came together. And so um, now uh, 60 years, um, a 60 year record, and they really are a pioneer and an innovator in connecting young people of color with the outdoors. And, and Brian has worked with them quite a bit. Um, Charles Thomas, who's the executive director, was one of the first students um, that Helen Mary Williams really worked with and mentored. They developed a very close relationship. Um, Charles grew up um, uh, near where Mahares is today um, and, um, and kind of went in and, and bounced around um, uh, the, the, the Pasadena Unified School District and struggled, and, and he, he attributes a lot of his success. Um, to uh, Helen Mary Williams, and he's been hired by the National Park Service um, at one point to help them integrate their and diversify their um, their staff. So um, 
uh, they have a number of programs, and one of them that I'll, I'll mention is kind of their, um, they do, they take outdoor trips, but then they also have work crews, and they're trying to do job development, um, career development for young people of color in, in the outdoors. Brian, is there anything else I sh we should share about Outward Bound Adventures at this point? Yes, it's located at Muir High School, and um, it takes, I was just over there the day before yesterday, and there they are, they plan about a hundred trips a year. Uh, and they were just talking about some of the ones they're doing. One is to Catalina Island. They have one out to the Santa Monica mountains. Uh, during the summer, they try to have at least one Sierra trip and then they'll take a few students up to um, Mount Rainier. Uh, and um, they, they uh, it's, it's about um, experiential learning and it's about um, conservation. So teaching them to be conservationists and then to, as Marcus said, to provide uh, careers in the outdoors. So the crew in the bottom left corner is the, um, they have crews that are out uh, either helping the forest service. They have a contract now with the public, uh, passing the department of public works. And then with also another, other nonprofits like Arlington Garden and Pastina Audubon, and they um, provide uh, technical assistance with uh, forest management, uh, trail maintenance, uh, landscape design. So it's um, a pretty broad uh, uh, group of careers. And I see that Will has another question. And I'm going to stop, uh, see if I can just oh, stop sharing. And um, so I can see all of you. Yes. The question is Outward Bound Adventures related to the national organization Outward Bound, or are they separate organizations? That, that's a common question. They're separate organizations. Um, and so they share that that name, Outward Bound, as a, as a kind of an international organization, has a very similar, um, uh, do similar things, um, focused on personal development and people challenging their, um, their personal goals. But Outward Bound Adventures is has always been their own uh, organization. And um, as I say, you know, the, the environmental movement um, as a conservation movement has always struggled as, as being a, not being a very diverse movement. Um, and so uh, diversifying and, and understanding how to transform the environmental movement is, um, is a critical, uh, is a critical step that folks interested in conservation need to take. And we have a pioneer that started on the edge of the Arroyo um, and this continues to do cool. this wonderful work. So um, I, I just want to stop that, stop this here and, and before we go on. And um, this, this is just a snapshot. And I just wanted to see if, if any, of, any of you uh, know of other uh, positive or negative aspects of the Arroyo's history that you should feel we should be highlighting as we kind of discuss this. Or if this connects to, to maybe some of the other things that you, you know about or have heard about in terms of Pasadena's past. Well, I just say this is all very interesting to me because it's a very rich past with a lot of different cross currents going on that I was never aware of. And I'm new to Pasadena. I only live in Pasadena about two years and only in California for five. So uh, this is it's all news to me, but I, I think it's a wonderful presentation. I'm very much enjoying it. Well, I, I, I agree with that. I'm just going to say that the people I, I used to live used to live in Pasadena. I now live in Portland, but we lived on the Arroyo Terrace Drive, and then mm. we left on Kent Street and Altadena, overlooking the Arroyo. And it was totally unaware of the stuff we're talking about today. So it really is a major educational experience. Based upon your um, your your knowledge and your study in this in 1619 project, as we kind of tell this story, which is part of what Arroyo Cycle Police Keepers is trying to do, which of these um, what of that I just shared 
uh, do you feel is most important, given your kind of knowledge and experience of, uh, of Pasadena that we should highlight? One of the things that I find most interesting is the national impact that a lot of things here have had and then the national patterns and the different cross currents that have taken place. I mean, I know that uh, my understanding of Pasadena is it's pretty much a white town, but then you look at this, you can say, wait a minute, it's been a lot more things than that. There's a lot more going on here in the history than what I see looking around. And uh, so I, I find it very interesting to, to see the kinds of things that took place. And I was particularly interested when you mentioned Robert Owen, because he's quite a character. You look at what, what he accomplished and say, good grief, he went from being a slave, he bought himself out and then he bought his family out. And then he became a, a landowner and started buying up land around here and became one of the wealthiest people around. And I'm sure his legacy goes on. I'd like to learn more about him. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There was just uh, uh, just a couple of weeks ago they they installed a monument um, at El Prieto Canyon um, yeah. that that you probably heard about. I had heard about El Prieto, but I hadn't I didn't connect that with Arroyo Seco at all because I don't know the geography here. So I'd heard the story about him, but I didn't have him connected to Arroyo Seco at all. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, dive back in. We're gonna talk a little bit more about kind of what's happening today. So that's kind of the past, um, and and kind of kind of bring us up to date. Um, and then uh, and then we have some questions after that. We'll see how we're doing on time. So let me. So um, today, you know, there are a number of different recreational um, groups that that make use of the arroyo, and um, and many of them have kind of aspects that are trying to make the arroyo accessible and, and an equitable space. Um, the Rose Bowl Aquatic Center, which was um, built over where the plunge was, um, now gives swim lessons to all third graders in Pasadena Unified School District. Um, uh, Kids Space Museum, uh, which moved into what was once the horticultural, the Fannie Mae Horticultural Center, those buildings, um, has discounts for EBT recipients to, um, to make their uh, admissions more, more accessible. Um, all fourth graders uh, in PUSD, they uh, go to the Lower Royal with the Armory Center as part of their Children Investigate the Environment program. So they uh, they learn about the native plants. They talk with the naturalists, and they they uh, do some art projects that are inspired by their time in the arroyo. Um, and then uh, Passy Roving Archers also sponsors uh, different youth workshops um, that or groups can come to them and or say, okay, we want to do a we want to do a teach some archery. And they even uh, work with they've worked with um, with uh, people who can't see. Um, uh, folks who who have lost their eyesight in terms of uh, firing at a target, you think that'd be impossible, but but archery isn't just uh, kind of what you can see; it's what you can feel. And so they've they've worked with a lot of people with um, with different physical challenges to make archery accessible. Um, there's also the stables and the casting pond, um, and I've spoken with them, and they're also looking for ways to kind of make their their activities more uh, more accessible. Um, and then you have uh, you have the golf course, which I just wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about because it's it's it, it kind of embodies this idea of the two eyed seeing. There's there's a lot of complex stuff going on with the golf course that you know golf as a, as a sport um, has a has kind of a cultural association with wealth and privilege. Um, and but the Brookside Golf Course is a municipal golf course, so it's 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 open to everybody. Um, at the same time, there were protests in 1968 um, because you do can pay a membership. You could pay a membership to join the golf club, and um, and that there was a, a, a either a, in. A, I'm not sure if it was if it was written or if it was just understood, but there was a color line in terms of um, access to that golf course, and so that the pro am, the LA Open was at Brookside in 1968. And there was this question whether the, 
the African-American golfers who were part of that circuit would cross picket lines from uh, local African-Americans who were, um, who were protesting uh, the, the actual or perceived color line in that, um, in that club. Um, and then today uh, we have First Tee of Greater Pasadena, which is an effort to uh, diversify folks who are taking up the sport. And so um, they will uh, connect young people with and get them uh, clubs and give them lessons and give them access to uh, Brookside and to other uh, golf courses. Um, and Brian was telling me that um, at, at one point, the, many of the local high schools had golf clubs as well. Um, the golf course was also uh, for uh, several years was a really a source of jobs for African-Americans who, who had positions as the starters and as marshals on the course. Um, and then today, uh, just this year, uh, you see on the right on May 2023, there's, there's an improvement uh, project proposed to expand the driving range and to put in a miniature golf course um, around along an acre right against the Arroyo Seco uh, flood control channel. And so uh, if you following the local politics, this was just tabled by the city council to collect more feedback. So there's opportunities to discuss whether or not this is a, a good idea or not. Um, there are concerns by a lot of people interested in the Arroyo and interested in the environment um, that uh, putting in something right next to the channel where a lot of people hope we can eventually take out the channel um, and get more of our water into the aquifer um, and restore habitat. So when we think about equity, um, it's equity for people, but then there's the argument of equity for wildlife um, and equity for kind of the non-human world as well. So um, you can look for, for that debate um, about what happens with the golf course and, and also fences. Like, you know, we have to think about the, the, the golf course is fenced, uh, you know, and, and those fences aren't necessarily, they have nets to hold in the balls, but the, but the fences really, you know, why are the, the fences send a message, I think, in some ways to people. And so there's, been folks like Larry Wilson and the Pasadena Star News who advocated for taking down the fences and just making it seem like a more accessible space. Um, and then here's another picture of a current picture from Pasadena Water and Power of those um, outward bound adventurous crews that are working down into the Arroyo um, and uh, hopefully can be expanded, those work crews. And then, um, of course, the legacy of, um, of segregation within Pasadena um, has really uh, continues to persist in our school system and in the public-private divide uh, in our schools. Um, and Brian you know, knows the exact statistics, but uh, you know, I believe it's about half of the school-aged children are in pri the private system, um, which has uh, made it difficult for our, our public school system, more difficult than it, it, it should be. And so the uh, Climate Resiliency Environmental Education Center is a proposed environmental education center that would be up in Hahamungna. And these photos are from Hahamungna Watershed Park, north of Devil's Gate Dam. And um, it would be the, and this photo on the left is, is uh, at the walkabout um, that they had this, this last March, the 30th anniversary of Hahamungna Watershed Park. And the city council folks, Tyron Hampton and Justin Jones, talking about the importance of the, of the Arroyo and Ahamangna. And so the creek uh, facility, which has been in the master plan for about 15 years, but has never gotten funding, um, would be in Ahamangna near where the native plant nursery is, near where Tom Sawyer Camp is, the old fire station, um, old forest service station that's there, and would be a potential place where um, private and public school uh, young people can have a shared experience and use the Arroyo as the basis for that shared experience and, and kind of help integrate our community. Um, Brian, do you wanna say anything about Creek? It's a collaborative of um, community organizations that have a vision for uh, providing the opportunity for you know, this continued dialogue and discussion around uh, climate change and how it's impacting us, uh, water issues, and um, how we recharge aquifers, 
uh, birds and their role in um, our um, uh, the health of our environment and nature. Uh, and so the, it's a broad coalition and, and some of the members include, of course, as we mentioned earlier, Outward Bound Adventures, Arlington Garden, Pastina Audubon Society, uh, Rose Seco Foundation, Friends of the LA River, uh, Nature for All. So it's, and then there are, there are other people, individuals and groups that um, would like to see it happen too. So the vision is to have classrooms, it's to have a workshop space, it's to have meeting space, uh, maybe an auditorium, it's to have office space, it's to have research space, maybe even an observation tower so that um, the learning, uh, research, um, profound investigation can occur right here in our backyard. Um, and interestingly, in that photograph um, that Marcus showed, he didn't mention that the, the big building in the background was the parking lot for JPL. So it's, it's adjacent, it's in the shadow of JPL. And um, we, we took some Muir High School students up there right before school ended in May. And uh, our, our guide said, you know, a lot of people don't understand, but one of the main uh, research areas of JPL is actually climate change. The reason why we throw satellites up in the sky is so that we can look back on the planet and analyze everything from uh, storm genesis to uh, rainfall in various places to temperature changes to actually one of the most important ones that they talked about was sea uh, rise, sea elevation rise. Um, through the satellite imagery, they're able to detect even minute changes uh, less than an inch in um, sea elevation rise and what the implications are for coastal cities all over the, the world, uh, including uh, Miami and Florida, and, uh, but also Bangladesh and um, India, the places where sea level rise is really important. So to be able to have a center um, here in Pasadena that's focused on uh, environmental issues would be extremely valuable. So that's what the group is proposing. And um, they're, they're hoping to work with the city to be able to accomplish this vision. So happy to answer any questions about it if, if you have some. It's, it's a good example of, of the question of how we could use the Arroyo to generate equity across Pasadena. Um, and that, that the school system is one of those places where there is a lot of inequity and, and this could be one way to address it and bring all those resources to bear so that everybody has access to it. Just want to pause and have us all take, let's all take a breath <laughs> together. <laughs> so one, two, three, breathe. Let's get us all in the same space. Um, does anybody have any, any comments on where we are today uh, in, in terms of the Arroyo? Um, we have a little bit more presentation, but um, I just wanted to see if if anybody had any, anything is sticking um, from, from what I just presented about where we are today. This is not quite that, but uh, Marcus, I'd be interested if you'd tell us a little bit more about what the Placekeeper uh, organization is, the Arroyo Seco Placekeeper. Okay. Tell us a little bit more about that organization or group. Well, then let me share the screen because that's the next, uh, that's the next part of the presentation. Ah. <laughs> You're going to get your wish, Dick. Yeah, well not coordinated that just came up <laughs> um great yeah uh so we'll just hide these meeting controls so that's the next part of the presentation um uh and i'm going to give a little bit of context so um about 15 years ago uh, uh there was a report that came out called for something called creative placemaking that there had been a lot of interest in the previous 10 years about the role that arts and culture can play in community development and in, in kind of helping support economic development and, and bringing communities closer together. And all that work kind of got collected under this banner called creative placemaking. 
uh, report that was sponsored by Obama's uh, National Endowment for the Arts um, in 2009. And they say, creative placemaking animates public and private spaces, rejuvenates structures and streetscapes, improves local business viability and public safety, and brings diverse people together to celebrate, inspire, and be inspired. And so this photo is just one example of a very classic creative placemaking outside the 30th Street Station in Philadelphia, creating a place for people to gather and, and build community and kind of enjoy. Um, there are a lot of excitement or interest in this, and a lot of the funders of arts and culture activities nationally, the Ford Foundation, um, the Kresge Foundation, a lot of um, the financing institutions, they came together in a consortium that lasted for 10 years from 2010 to 2023, and they created this National Creative Placemaking Fund. And they gave out money across the country and did a lot of research on this idea of creative placemaking. Um, but there was a lot of there was a lot of unease for um, arts and culture groups that have been working in neighborhoods and communities for a long time, and they said, "Well, we don't need our places remade; they're already places." And so there was a real push to change the, the, the language and the rhetoric. So there's really creative place keeping rather than creative place making. And these grassroots groups that have been working across the country for a long time, um, they think about using arts and culture for civic purposes, for to spark dialogue, to boost civic participation, to help heal communities, to connect people with place, including kind of the natural world and to help amplify the, the stories of silenced groups. And so they have, they kind of pushed back against thinking about placemaking just as kind of um, new awnings on businesses, new flower planters. They were like, no, this is really about how we relate to each other and, and creating uh, capacity and skill building and leadership training um, for the communities that they worked with. Um, so one example of creative placekeeping was the Arroyo Fest event, which I um, I had a, a central role in back in 2003, 20 years ago, where we shut down the historic Arroyo Seco Parkway for a walk and a bike ride and a festival. And part of the goal of doing that was to draw attention to issues around parks and open space, transportation, housing, arts and culture, all through the Arroyo. And so I'm, I'm happy to announce that this year is the for the first time since 2003 when this uh, event took place, they're gonna be doing this event again on October 29th. Um, the, the, the highway, the parkway, the Pasadena freeway is gonna be shut down for folks to get their tricycles and rollerblades and bicycles and, um, and, and walk on the, on the parkway. So that's really exciting, um, but that's a good example of a creative placekeeping event. Other ideas could be the bridge, the Colorado Street Bridge Party just happened this last weekend. So that you can have special events, like I said, you can have exhibits, you can have um, performances, that's lineage dance performance, uh, dance uh, company in the uh, city hall. Uh, doing a, a creative placekeeping to engage people in coming to City Hall. You can have arts-driven uh, planning processes. You can have um, parks creation, creating green space. And then you can even kind of, their, kind of the cutting edge is, is kind of putting arts artists within city government to actually um, uh, help them bring the creativity of arts into this kind of community problem solving, civic problem solving. And this uh, work has a long history. It goes back to the settlement houses in the 19th century in Jane Addams. It's a photo of Jane Addams. Uh, the WPA murals from the 1930s, the, the federal theater projects um, in the 40s, and the arts, the Free Southern Theater, which was part of the civil rights movement, and in California, uh, Teatro Campesino, which worked with farm workers. So there's kind of a long history of using arts and culture to address community issues. So what I did was I uh, created a, a project called the Royal Sickle Placekeepers. Um, have the values on the right is, is kind of what I'm using to guide the project. It's really about listening, uncovering, and then listening to everybody's stories um, and seeing what happens when we put those stories in conversation with one another. 
We don't try to insist on one story being the objective truth. So it's not about choosing one story. It's not about choosing one issue. It's not about creating a great artwork. Um, it's, it's really about what can we learn by understanding the stories that people have about the Arroyo and what kind of questions can we f discover in asking uh, the, in, in kind of learning about the story. So the questions that we ask um, are really what I see as kind of the, the, the keys to the locks on our imagination for what the Arroyo can be. And so a lot of it is using art and storytelling to try to find like, what's the right question we should ask about the Arroyo? So I chose the central and lower Arroyo as my case study area. So uh, the Rose Bowl, the golf course, and going all the way down to the South Pasadena border. And that's what I've been researching and where a lot of this information comes from. And I pulled together uh, an advisory group, which Brian has been a part of. A lot of um, grassroots, environmental heritage, um, arts organizations have been a part of the advisory group. And then started in 2021, uh, recruiting the advisory group, and then have been doing researching these uh, topics on the left. We held some public events last fall, a historical ecology walk and a workshop. And then we had a creative dialogue session where I shared the research and boiled things down into the questions. And the question about how the Arroyo could be an engine of equity was one of those questions. And we pulled people together to have a kind of a deep dialogue about what they thought about some of those questions. And we had visual and performing artists who presented some works in progress to initiate dialogue about each of those questions. And then we had a, a smaller group work as devising workshop um, to kind of think about, okay, what, what should we be doing with the placekeepers? What are some projects we can do? And we, we identified that the um, Arroyo Seco placekeepers really should have two functions. One is events like Arroyo Fest, interactive events, performances, celebrations that are grounded in neighborhood history that are, um, that are disruptive, that, um, that disrupt the status quo, but also provide an invitation for participation, uh, for kind of joyful participation. And then those events should be linked to the design of site-specific places and programs like the Creek Center that could build community among people, but also with the non-human world, build what I call convivial common ground. And so we came out with um, just this in June, uh, the end of June, we, I kind of settled on three projects, which I think should be the focus of Arroyo Seco Placekeepers. The first one is, which I'll talk a little bit more about, is Unpaved Pasadena, is kind of the, or Soften the Ground. And it's about using the idea of, of capturing water and replenishing our aquifer um, to using that as a, as a focus, but using it not just to take out concrete, but also to build community and to break up some of the, 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 the social relations and the power relations that have, have formed kind of and solidified just like concrete. Those kind of need breaking up as well. And so, um, so that's what that project is about and figuring out how we can actually take out the flood control channel and restore a living stream. The second project is about activating the 710 corridor. As you probably know, the, the 710 area, there's 50 acres that the right in the core of Pasadena that's going to be repurposed and a new master plan is going to be developed where the, the 710 uh, freeway that has exits at California and Del Mar. So uh, instead of having that um, just run through a series of consultants, using arts and culture to, um, to teach some of this history um, about equity in Pasadena and the displacement that happened with the construction of that freeway and activate it, get people even out on the road, like with the Royal Fest, um, and make it a community space and, and get people attached to that space so they can kind of shepherd it through the next decade of development and make it a, a place where everybody feels like they belong. So that's the second project. And the third is part of this, I came into this by, as a playwright. Um, I got an MFA in playwriting. And for my thesis, I, I wrote a play about um, Hahamungna Watershed Park and the communities that surround it, the neighborhoods that surround it and what they share. And, um, and so that play uh, is about, the plot of it entails, how do we end up building this environmental education center? Um, as I said, it's been on the books for, for over 15 years. And so 10 years ago, when I wrote this play, it was still like, how do we end up getting this done? 
And so now since the coalition has come together to, to support the Creek Center, it feels like the right time to try to produce the play and build community support. So I'd love to do that play, a community-based production in Hahamunga Park to build support for the Creek Center. And Brian said I should talk a little bit more about um, uh, the first project, the, the, water, the unpaid Pasadena. And the most important thing is this graph. And it shows the decline in the groundwater levels. We get 40% of our water in Pasadena from our Raymond Basin Aquifer, which is under our feet. And then the rest we get from the Colorado River. And so, as you know, the Colorado River, we're gonna have to get cutbacks and we need this uh, graph to go in the other direction, which is why combining possibly short-term projects to get people started thinking this way with like little designing pocket parks in every neighborhood to capture stormwater and replenish the aquifer with kind of a long-term goal of taking up the flood control channel and using the golf course area as a way to capture uh, the water, which is one of the reasons why I'm 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 personally not in favor of putting the miniature golf course right next to the channel. That um, that I think that uh, we want to save that ground for uh, make it permeable. And so the project has these these little park designs, um, stormwater capture, um, uh, in partnership with artists and with historians and with neighborhood associations. Um, there's a workforce component to it getting those crews from Outward Bound Adventures to, um, to do the work um, of taking up the concrete in, across Pasadena and, and, the, and the asphalt and creating these, these parks like Ardlington Garden. And then um, turning the work parties into work parties. So working with neighborhood associations when you open up these new spaces to throw a party for the Outward Bound Adventure crew, which can build community and break down some of these social barriers um, and, and create more of a sense of belonging. Um, so, so those are, those are um, uh, some of the, what Arroyo Fest or what um, Arroyo Cycle Placekeepers is, is trying to do. And um, I'll just stop there for questions. It's not a question, but I have something I, I heard the other day that I said, wow, that's an interesting idea. I heard people talking about the concept of geographic features having rights. And I thought, wow, that's that could be a powerful kind of thing. You know, this is you could talk about lakes and rivers having rights and how do they get that and what might those rights be? And I think about the Arroyo Seco and say, hey, the Arroyo Seco might be something that has rights. And when would those rights be violated? And how, how would you establish those legally? And it seemed like a very interesting concept that I had never really thought about before. And it's all a matter of definition. I mean, the governor, yeah. you know, the law could define uh, that uh, geographic features have rights. I mean, corporations have rights. If corporations can have rights, why can't rivers? One of the one of the other questions that came out of the research, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'll preface this by saying that no one that I spoke with um, was really um, uh, really vehemently against the Rose Bowl. That um, that people recognize the value of the Rose Bowl, the history of the Rose Bowl, um, kind of the, the, its role in kind of our our community. Um, but the contrast, if you go back through time and you look at the history between the investment um, that the city has made in improving the Rose Bowl and making the Rose Bowl a venue um, versus the investment in the river, um, which was really uh, the reason that Pasadena is where it is, um, is really striking. And so as I looked at the, the, this space, um, you know, I kind of got this idea that the river is kind of like the older child, the good child, the, the, the hardworking older sister. And in 1922, like the, the precocious kind of uh, younger, younger brother comes in and moves into the arroyo and um, suddenly is the apple of the parent's eye and, um, and can do no wrong even though the Rose Bowl has struggled um, with several uh, uh, financially and, and with um, chasing after, you know, uh, golden dreams, the golden apple of the National Football League and all kinds of things. 
um, while the, the older sister just keeps on doing its thing unappreciated. And so part of the question was like, what would it take for the city and the community to invest as much in the river as it does in the Rose Bowl? And, and that generated a lot of interest in our creative dialogue session, a lot of energy um, to, to think about because the, the history, the, the channel was put in and finished really in the late 30s. I found newspaper articles by the 50s um, saying this channel has ruined the park, like we need to get it out. And um, really uh, energy really started to pick up in the 70s around um, figuring out we want to take out the channel. And so it's been the Army Corps of Engineers has proposed uh, several designs for uh, a more natural stream bread through the golf course and in the lower Arroyo. Um, and uh, there's a lot of questions about that, that I'm happy to talk about, but I think just thinking about those two things together, is, um, Dick, as you're saying, like, you know, can geographic areas have rights? You think about the river and you, then you think about the Rose Bowl and, and those are siblings. And so part of the story for me is, is saying, the parents saying, okay, sit down and stay still. It's your, it's your sis, older sister's time to shine. We're gonna take care of her um, right now. So we love you, but we're gonna, we're, it's, it's her time to shine. Well, I'll tell you, my answer to that would be figure out ways for people to make money by improving the river. Because <laughs> people made money by putting up the Rose Bowl. So if you could well, figure out how people could make money by improving the river, they'd take care of the river. And that's what the, you know, um, Marcus talked a lot about the Outward Bound Adventures mm -hmm. uh, process. Right. And that's that's part of what it is, is to be able to figure out um, not only around conservation, but I mentioned several of the careers that are involved in environmental um, uh, protection, as well as environmental um, development, uh, and then uh, everything from tourism to, uh, you know, um, plant life, uh, animal life. So there's a wide array of environmental careers. It's just a matter of, I think, readjusting one, our uh, priorities, and then how we think about how the economy or how the local economy works. Is it, is it dependent on the Rose Bowl or is, it, um, is there another type of economy that could be developed uh, around uh, conservation, around um, tourism, around um, uh, recreation, uh, around water? Um, you know, it's, it's thinking about it a little bit differently. So, because the one one other last point is the Rose Bowl generates uh, quite a bit of income, but it also is very, very, very expensive. So the the re the renovation that occurred was over two hundred million dollars. So it, it even if even if it generates a million dollars a year for the next whatever two hundred years, you're still trying to pay that back. Um, it, it'll take a while for it to really be able to. Uh, break even or, or make a considerable amount of money. So I think that's part of the conversation that isn't uh, discussed. Sorry, Marcus, you were about to. Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly the point is that part of this unpaid Pasadena idea is thinking about um, that graph is key because um, water bills are going to go up and they're going to go up quickly and it's going to be a real shock to the system and it could change the political calculus for how we think about these issues. And the idea of like, well, how much is that water worth that comes through that down that stormwater channel, down that flood control channel? If we ca if we captured that, then how much um, how much money could we save? So it's it's it could Pasadena, and that's going to be happening all over Southern California. And so could Pasadena become the regional center for how to do stormwater capture and regenerative landscaping? Could we build out that sector of the economy, get ahead of the curve, so uh, we can make the Arroyo a showcase for how to how to capture stormwater, make the golf course a showcase for how to capture stormwater, how to make it turn it into a big sponge, 
And then you look at the ledger, like how much money are we going to save? It's also an equity issue because as water bills start to shoot up, um, water is a fundamental right. And so um, people who don't have means to pay those extravagant water bills, how are they going to, um, it's going to cut right into their bottom line, into their budget. You can't, you can't skimp on water. So the more that we can, uh, water we can preserve, the more um, equitable kind of our economy is going to be. And a, uh, a basic uh, kind of a, a fact or a statistics to uh, analyze that sort of information is it costs about five times as much to import water from the Colorado River as it does to pump it from the ground locally. So if it's uh, $200-ish, and these are just round figures, um, to pump from the Raymond Aquifer, it's about $1,000 per acre foot uh, to ship it in from the Colorado River. So it, these are not insignificant amounts of money. And um, so it's, it's thinking about how do we manage our local supplies um, effectively. As another point, as, as an Oregonian, ex Pasadena, uh, keep your hands off our Columbia River water because that's where they want to get it from. <laughs> but the economics of it are pretty, pretty startling. I, I, I also, in terms of the rights of land, from my way, that's one other way of saying enlightened rights of people, the quality of life of people, particularly lower income people, we're talking about it, people of color, is one of the criteria that you have. And you'd say, if you have a beautiful stream bed and parks around it, are the people in the area, especially the lower income and people of color, going to benefit by that more than having the rose pole or have different types of recreation? It's, it's, a, it's first people centered as far as I'm concerned. Thank, thank you for that observation, Will. Um, and, and that's what it's centered around when we make decisions, political decisions, uh, at a, especially at a local level. Uh, but it's who who will benefit the, the questions on any decision and we can look at the Brookside golf course as an example is who will benefit from if the decision is a yes and who will benefit uh, from it if it's a no um, and thinking about um, then what are the longer term impacts of those types of decisions again the uh, the Rose Bowl was built 100 years ago. And we're, we're still working on figuring out um, its best and highest use for the community. Uh, and is it still viable? And, and just to go down uh, that path just a little further with the, the new stadiums over in Inglewood and then at, uh, around USC, um, it's, and then down in Carson, it's, um, it's more and more difficult for the Rose Bowl to compete with those other stadiums. So you're thinking about viability at this point in time too. So um, that's a great way to kind of uh, aim toward wrapping up. What I would like to do in the last couple of minutes is uh, I was wondering if uh, we could get a little feedback from you and, and maybe be thinking about what, what in this presentation uh, was surprising to you. What what kind of piqued your interest? What was what was new and unique? Um, just anybody um, raise your hand or just come off mute and let us know what what was really revealing to you that you weren't aware of before. For me, I have been struggling trying to understand. I understand what the seven ten stub. I don't have a problem with that, but to understand what was lost when it, when it, that whole idea came together to connect these freeways and all. So I, I got a much better sense of what that Eastern rim of the Arroyo looked like at one time and um, how people interacted with it. Then um, I, I guess I've always sort of had this notion that the Arroyo was something that people admired and occasionally some very unusual people walk down into it. And um, I'm walking away now with a, a much better sense 
of what it meant to people and how they interacted with it than I had an hour ago. Thank you very much, Sharon. That, that, was, that was really valuable. Anyone else, what, what stuck out to you? What, what was of interest to you during the presentation? Well, I'm struck by the positive things that happened in the history around here and by the fact that the positive things that took place were, were uh, done really by a diverse group of people, not by a small group of people controlling things, but different groups within the population put together the leadership and took the leadership to make things happen. And I'm, I was very interested in that. I had not expected that. Yes, thank you, Dick. Anyone else want to add? Um, I have one other question that I wanted to pose to you is that how might you use this information, especially because the 1619 project is, is thinking about racial justice, is thinking about uh, issues of equity, of um, eliminating discriminatory practices, what what would you take from what you heard today, what you learned today, to try to continue to move forward with um, social racial justice in our community? Well, for me, what it emphasizes is that this is a long and continuing struggle. And that positive things have been happening and we've got a lot of negative things going on right now. And the response to that has got to be to continue the struggle. That's for sure. Other, other thoughts? How might this catalyze your work? This was so informative to me, and I would love to know that you're presenting to other people in the community. Um, I think this was absolutely fabulous. And I think most people don't think about it and have no idea. So whoever will listen to you, please um, reach out. People you, need to hear this. And it's presented in such an interesting way in a way that I think people can relate to. Really well, me, well done. Thank you. Yeah, let me just say about that, that this presentation is recorded and it will be on our website and available and it'll be available on our YouTube channel. So it's publicly available so you can point other people to it and tell them about it. They can come. And I we agree. have we have a whole series of presentations that have been done by Brian Beery and uh, uh, around this kind of topic about history of Pasadena. And I'm talking to Brian and we expect to have more. So we expect to have more great presentations coming along in the future. Yeah, um, Judith, thank you for those comments. That was really, really helpful. And I, I just wanna close with uh, thanking Marcus. Uh, so much of uh, my awareness about the Arroyo Seco and then of this part of Pasadena has been informed by Marcus and his research and his interviews with numerous Pasadenans. So I wanna thank you, Marcus, for all that diligent work and then also for trusting in me enough to to share it with me um, and and to be able to take some time today to share it with these people because i agree with judith i would love to be able to find other venues to to be able to have these types of conversations so thanks to marcus and thanks to dick and the pastina village for hosting us and um, marcus any last words from you I, yeah, I just want to echo the gratitude. Um, I, I really appreciate your attention and and um, and your patience. Um, has kind of gone through all of this. I put my email uh, in the chat. M, as in Marcus, V as in Victor, R E N N E R at gmail.com. And if you'd like to be added to the Arroyo Seco Placekeepers mailing list, um, we're uh, I'm going to be organizing a, a walk uh, that's going to be talking about a lot of this information in August. It's going to be very hot. <laughs> we're going to do it early on a Saturday morning, um, and then we'll be having some you know small events. But a lot of it, the next year is going to be um, uh, trying to raise some money for some of these uh, projects to get off the ground and doing some of the background networking and um, pulling people together. Because Dick, as you say, it's it. it, it there have been people who have come together in the past to help us get where we are today to help actually make make progress and um and we need to keep uh 
keep having, keep take their inspiration and 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 pay it forward to the next generation, um, so that a hundred years from now people can can talk about what we did um, and 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 celebrate it um, the way we're celebrating some of the activists that um, that really kind of helped us get where we are today um, and not forget the struggle. So That's true, you. and I want to thank. Uh... You, Brian, and, and Marcus, both for a great presentation. I really appreciated it, and I look forward to hear, having other people uh, learn some of, of this stuff, too. And I want to say another thing. If, if, you want to, if there's anybody here that wants to be added to the mailing list for, for the 1619 group, just send me an email. I have a separate mailing list from what the village sends out. So uh, if you want to be, if you want to get news about this, it's also up on our blog post, the 1619 blog post on our website. And these meetings, the 1619 are open. We invite guests. You can see that we've got people from a lot of different places here. We do invite guests here so you can share the link and you can share the information about the presentations twice a month, first and third Fridays at 10 a.m. and at 12 a.m. And there was a small glitch I noticed, I just learned about that was on our website. Uh, uh, somebody was looking at it just before the meeting and said that on the website it said that registration was limited and that and that registration was closed and that's a technical glitch in the software we do not limit uh, participation here and, and registration does not close for the 1619 so we're going to have to that's that's a glitch in our software and we're going to see if we can get that fixed up so but uh, invite your friends let them know what we're doing here if they're if they seem interested and tell them that they're welcome to join us and with that, I think uh, we're out of time and uh, it's good to close meetings on time because people are more willing to come to meetings if they know they're going to close. <laughs> so thank you very much, everybody, for coming. I'm, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we look forward to having more guests and doing a lot more like this. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dick. Thank Thanks you. for being here, everybody. All right.